Hello, I am Mark Hummel, and this is Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party, and our podcast today is going to be with one of my absolute favorite musicians, the great Billy Flynn from right. Green Bay, Wisconsin, now living in Milwaukee, and I've known Billy since, what, 87 or something? Yeah. Somewhere. Quite a while. We go back to my days of touring when I first started touring in Wisconsin a lot, and Billy is somebody that I met right out the gate. I think I heard about you from the Futuramics when you and Jim Liven had the trio. And, and you blew me out of the water with that. And uh, I just wanted to get a chance to talk to you about your career and blues and the state of blues and what it, what it takes to be a musician. Because this ain't no easy life. And... Uh, I think the first thing I want to ask you is, is did you get into blues in high school? Because I know you started playing guitar, what, like around 12, 13? Yeah, so I, I, always, I always pretty much play guitar. I, I, before I had a guitar, I had a ukulele. Wow. And the reason I had the ukulele was because the guitar was uh, way too big for me. That's how small it was. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, ukulele made you look bigger. Well, it's funny because I, I actually learned so much on that instrument because uh, I went, okay, I'd ask so many questions. What string is this? And they would tell me, and then i go, okay, well, that's this. And I knew the ABCs by that right. time, so I, I had to go, oh, that's E, so this must be F, and this is G, you know, and I figured out, you know, what the, what the notes were. Yeah. That now here's a question I have for you. Growing up in Green Bay, that's such an unusual place mm -hmm. for somebody to get into blues. Mm -hmm. uh, was that in, in your teen years that you kind of got into blues? Mm -hmm. I or always, before, I, I, I think I've always was interested in jazz and blues, uh -huh. and I didn't know the difference between between the two because I would hear a lot of music. You know, when we were kids growing up, they had always said cool music on the Twilight Zone and, right. and Alfred Hitchcock and somebody would be in a bar and they would play the jukebox. They'd always have some sort of jumping 12 bar blues swing. Right. So that, that was my idea what I thought blues was, you know, I mean, and um, I think it was there, I mean, going way back because I think Elvis was the first time I heard the blues. Right. In some of his songs where he would just have a couple licks where the guitar sure. would play and I'm, I go, that's what I like. Heartbreak like Hotel or mm, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Sure. So uh, how about surf music? Because I know you're really into mm -hmm. surf music now. Were yeah. you into it back when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah. That was, um, for me, was uh, a thing that where I heard the Ventures. And um, I guess that was a little bit before surf music, like Walk, Don't Run. You know, right. And I was really young at the time. I, you know under 10 years old, and uh, I fell in love with the Ventures, and uh, uh, also there was a group called the Astronauts, fabulous, uh, and before that, Dwayne Eddy. Oh, right, I always, right, we were I talking about, about that. Dwayne yeah. Eddy and, um, um, you know, stuff like that. So I think instrumental music was so popular at the time. Right. That uh, Al Hurt, right. all stuff like that, it all caught my ear. Right. <laughs> Al Hurt has a little connection to blues, I guess, if you yeah, think of yeah. trad jazz and... and yeah, and, yeah, yeah there, it's always seemed like there was a connection to it. Yeah. So when you first... Uh, now, what? how did you end up... Did you ended up hearing... Was Jimmy Dawkins the first guy you ever saw that was a real blues guy? In Green uh, Bay? There was I somebody who told me that I you think saw B. B. Green King, Bay. The B.B. King. And, he came and, to Green Bay? Uh, close to Green Bay and went to see him. And okay. uh, I was 14 at the time. That's the same time I met Jimmy Dawkins and uh, right. Jimmy Rogers, Johnny Little John, Mighty Julian. And you met all of them in Green Bay? Yes. That's amazing. Yes. Well, the, the thing is, you know, like you were saying about Green Bay is that uh, right. later on, you know, when I would, you know, go to other countries and stuff, I would go, you know... They, they have a. Um, they seem to be the blues is accessible to them. Right. So I'm only 200 miles right. from right. you know right. from Chicago. From Chicago, yeah. So all of that that um, that that art form or um, that that thing that they had spread around, you know. Right. Um, and there was Tom Radai, the booking agent that booked 
all of the artists. Right, and he in, was right in Milwaukee. So and yeah. how, you know, I mean, at the age of four, between age 14 and 15, I had met B.B. King wow. and, uh, and and all of them. And yeah. then Howlin' Wolf, I went to see Howlin' Wolf. I Did you meet him? Yes, I did. Wow. I went and I <laughs> walked into a club, and that was in Milwaukee. And, a little um, skinny kid walking yeah. up to Howlin' Wolf. <laughs> well, when I walked in That's the bar, bold. we were, we were I was 14, or I was 15, and my friend was 16. Right. And... Uh, we drove there to get there and not knowing for sure, you know, if he was going to be there. And we walked in and there was only one person other than a bartender in the club. And that was Holland Wolf. Wow. I walked up to him immediately and talked to what him for trip. about 30 minutes. And wow. A great guy. That's awesome. Fantastic person. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, somebody from the Midwest that grew up in this kind of white collar town that you met all these African-American blues artists and had an immediate, mm -hmm. sounds like you had a really immediate connection. Yeah, and really the truth is that, you know, in our um, in our city, we didn't have a lot of black people, and uh, the ones that were there were all my friends. Right, good, good wow, friends. that's interesting. Yeah. That's, yeah. Really, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I, really I mean, cool. I, I, I thought it, it added to the culture Hell without yeah. knowing that it was even called culture, you know, just... Um, yeah, that's something. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's something I've always respected about you. I mean, I look at look at your uh, your walls of your house and the photos that you have up, and it's like you're usually the lone white guy mm -hmm. <laughs> in the yeah. picture there. The funny thing yeah. is, I've never, I never, it never, I never thought of it. You I never just, think I of just it felt like, that. like yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, I felt course. like I belonged, and yeah. they made me feel welcome, and right. I made them feel good. They made me feel good, right. you know. And yeah, I, I totally kind of get it. Mutual yeah. respect. Because right. I've always been real serious about uh, pretty much you know about everything. You know, I mean, we like to have some laughs and that, but. I take it all pretty serious. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. um, be offending anybody with well, anything yet, I do. And or... you've always had an immediate like connection to you know the 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 past you know uh, story of blues and the mm -hmm. history of blues and just and and what makes blues and and that's that's such a rarity now in this day and age. Yeah, I mean, so many people listen to one Stevie Ray Vaughan record mm -hmm. and say I'm a blues man. Well, you know, in yeah. a way, it's similar to back then too, because that back then Stevie Ray was uh, Paul Butterfield and Mike Bluefield. Right, true. And they, even though they did have close connection to the blues, they were right. a little bit more mainstream. Yeah, and, and, they were. And a lost a lot of the uh, the um, I don't know what it is about the music. Um, you know, just something about the music, maybe just because they were a little bit more commercialized. Right. Trying to. You know, well, that's um, a record company thing, too. Yeah, record sure. companies are going to point you right. in that commercial direction, sure. no matter what. Right. You know, even B.B. King get, got sure. pointed in a right. commercial direction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's typical of what happens when, mm -hmm. you know, ma major labels pick up sure. people. Definitely. But uh, uh, one, of the first, one of the first guys that I always think of you associated with was Dawkins, mm -hmm. was Jimmy Dawkins mm -hmm. from Chicago, and, mm -hmm. and, and was he your first road gig? My first road gig was uh, Brian Lee. Okay, that's right. And he was the local uh, local and, blues man. Yeah, and, and uh, he was he was blind. He was blind. Yeah, and, and uh, ended up moving to New Orleans right. later on. Yeah, right. That's right, so. Yeah, he took me on the road the first time, but actually I had, in my own way, had been on the road because when I was, uh, all this time, I had my own band together, which was the Blues Express. Oh, okay. And um, we uh, we played a lot of um, uh, dances and uh, in school, things like and that. And that was with your brother? It was my brother. Yeah. And, uh, and Steve plays Doherty. Bass. Right. Yeah. And Steve Doherty. Wow. Steve Doherty. Like, you guys really go back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, to the beginning. I that's actually, amazing. I actually was the one that uh, that, that started him on drums. Because I wow. needed a drummer. He wasn't going to play harp, believe that it That is wild. <laughs> that's so wild. He said, I need a drummer, okay? Wow. Though. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, But I had my own band and a booking <laughs> agent. I right. mean, we were, we were playing at least, you know, two, three times a week. Yeah. Now, were yeah. you working all over the... A couple uh, different states. Wisconsin and Michigan, Michigan, Upper yeah. Peninsula, you yeah. said? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, tell me about when you first started going to Chicago and what that was like. Because you were there in the 70s, right? Yeah. 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 So you really got to hear 
all the greats yeah. in their real environment. And that's, you know, relatively, yeah. Yeah. you know, like, I mean, at the time, you know, in, in the 70s, um, you know, maybe around 76, 77 um, was when I first started going there. And I think uh, is around the time that I was playing with, uh, with Jimmy Dawkins first, I think may have been the first time I went to Chicago. But my, my, my older brother, Mike, was was the bass player for me too. Right. Um he he moved there. He he was working oh, there. Okay. All so right. we would uh after that we would go to the clubs and basically see everybody. Yeah. You know, they were um you know on the north side there was just so much activity. Yeah. Uh, you know, just everybody was at, at the clubs. You'd go to one club, Jimmy Johnson would be there, Lewis Myers would be there, you know, everybody would be at one place, right. I remember. Did you get to see Johnny Young a lot? I didn't. Oh, Unfortunately, okay. he was the one person that I didn't get to see. Wow. Even though I feel like I have a piece of him. Yeah, now. yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But Jimmy Rogers, you saw a lot. Jimmy Rogers. And, Did you see and Big Walter a lot? Big, Big Walter. Walter Big Walter yeah. was uh, on Sundays. Right. Even when I was with the legendary blues band in the 80s, I believe that we would go to... Uh, I forgot you what year Big Walter was that nineties when he died? He died in eighty one. Eighty one. Huh. Yep. Because I, I remember when he died. Because be uh, it was uh, I was doing a harmonica, battle of the harmonicas in San Francisco, and he died that year in eighty one. I guess with legendary, what we would do is, we would always like when somebody got dropped off, it would be in front of blues. Right. You know, and we, you know, when you got back to the city and. Uh, we would always go there, and I believe Sunnyland Slim played on Sundays. That's, okay. that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so you played with Dawkins. Who who did you play with after Dawkins? I actually played with Big Walter a couple times. You on did? Stage. Yes. Wow. Um, in the, the blues, I sat in with them, and also uh, Biddy Mulligans. There was oh, a club okay. here uh, in Chicago that. Uh, How do you sound when you play with him? Beautiful. Yeah. He was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I still remember he all the songs he did La Cucaracha, uh -huh. he did like a Sonny Boy Williamson type shuffle. Really? And, uh, wow. It was it was awesome. That's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, uh, when was the first time you played with Jimmy Rogers? Uh, first time I played with Jimmy probably was uh, at the King Biscuit Fest we, okay. uh, when I was with the Legendary. Okay. Because I never I never played in a, uh, in his band, but backed him up. On shows, I just realized the first time I saw you play was in Colorado with Legendary. Okay. Yeah, we came into town. I think right the last day you guys had a gig, mm -hmm. and at the time you had Jerry in the band. Jerry was obviously Jerry. still the leader, right. with Jerry Portnoy, and then Willie Smith, Calvin Jones. Uh -huh. uh, I forget who was playing piano. I don't think it was oh, mine. Daryl. Right? It Darryl was Daryl. Right. Daryl Davis. Yeah. Awesome piano. And piano. I remember we walked in, and and this was my impression of you as we walked in. Me and my guitar player, Pat Chase, who was a lefty and a really good guitar player, and we walked in. We were watching you play. And went, oh, this guy sounds pretty good. <laughs> and then you did the second number, and you're playing in a totally different style. Went, this guy's pretty damn good. <laughs> By the third number, we're like. This guy is damn good. Because <laughs> you were you were separating your styles of, of playing. Yeah. I mean, you'd play yeah. like B.B. King. You'd play like Albert King. You'd play mm -hmm. like Lewis Myers. You'd play mm -hmm. like Robert Jr. Lockwood. Yeah. You'd play like Muddy. I mean, you were just, yeah. you really could could define the styles mm -hmm. of blues in a way right. that that's what I've always liked. The style and and, is and the now style. you're interesting because now to me, you're you throw everything in there. Mm -hmm. And I love that because that's kind of what playing for a long time does yeah. is that you get to kind of like, you know, form the style that incorporates everything. Mm -hmm. Right. All the knowledge that yeah. you have. All the knowledge that you comes have. Comes in. Yeah. But I always believe, too, that, you know, if somebody's doing a song, it's not about me. You know, like, yeah. it's about that, what's happening at that time. I'm not going to sacrifice um trying to get a round of applause. That's right. secondary, the whole right. thing. The main thing is right. the band I should love sound that about good. You. Yeah. The band should sound good. Yeah. And it's the, an ensemble it should, attitude. Yeah, it should be yeah. appropriate. You know, like because if if you're singing a song and you know, you're working, 
you know, and, and, and you have somebody that's coming in and going like this to you, right. it confuses you. That's you know, right. If, you, if it's nice it and gets smooth you off the track. and laying down yeah. a nice groove in the background, then, then you feel comfortable. Right. And that's something you were just, you're one of my favorites because Thank of that. You, you know, you have, you have such an attitude of being part of the whole puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and, and the conversation aspect. Of yeah. It. And that is just, that's mm -hmm. huge. And you know, true is like like with me when I lead my own band and, and I'm fronting a band, I'm totally different than I am when I'm playing behind someone right, else. It's, right, it's a whole different thing. And you know how to the, the inter interesting thing too is that you really know how to assert yourself to the crowd mm -hmm. and get across what it is you're trying to get across. Yeah. And that, that again is. You know, it's like those are two really different roles mm -hmm. between side man mm -hmm. and front man. Mm -hmm. And you know how to move between the two mm -hmm. really, really well. Well, with that experience being a side man and being a leader. You've done it for so yeah, long. Right. You've done it really your whole career, it right. seems like. You've done both. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and I think that's kind of why you're such a first call guy. Well, you know, and that's, that's really to my advantage, too, because I enjoy working with people like you. And all the people that I work with, right. because they, uh, they, I learn from everybody. Yeah. You know, like when we do a song I never heard before, you know, then I'm gonna go, hey, Mark, uh, where did you get this from? You know, right. and you tell me, <laughs> right. and then I learn it, and it goes right. back in here. Yeah. Right. No, that's cool, man. <laughs> and the other thing I should mention is that you don't just play the guitar; you're a multi instrumentalist. You play really good harmonica. You play mandolin. Mm -hmm. Do you play bass and drums as well? I play drums. Actually, drums was my first instrument wow. because before I started, uh, you know, kind of like part of this is interesting too because uh, I was playing drums at a, at a time when, you know, I mean, I always messed around with the guitar, you know, uh, but uh, I was playing drums in, in a um, garage band when I was like in sixth grade. Right. And, uh, and that's right at the beginning of when psychedelic music was coming in. So I never learned how to play rock on a guitar. Right. I never, I'm not a rock and roll guitar player. Right. Maybe uh, Chuck, Chuck Berry, Berry and yeah. Will Richard and things <laughs> yeah. like that, but yeah, not, I'm not a, You're not a I'm psychedelic. I'm not a psychedelic. No, no. I enjoy it, but right. I, I've never learned how to do it. Right. right. But I was playing I know other guys when like Cream that, yeah. and Hendrix right. and, you know, was popular. I was playing drums at that time, so. Yeah. I didn't Did really you learn, learn to play, play rock drums? I tried. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Well, anyway, um, I'm thinking um, you lived in Green Bay at, at, t till, till what year? And then what did you actually... You, I know that Mary got the job in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And that, is that when you made your move to Milwaukee? Yeah, yeah. And what but, year was that? Oh, it was the 2013. Okay. But the thing so is, you were commuting a long way. Oh yeah, that's yeah. The, that was always been my thing. It's immediately I I knew that I had to get out of where I was. Too that was my main yeah. uh, my main thing because there was no interest in what I was doing. I felt like a comedian that people didn't laugh at. <laughs> really, I can understand. You know, that. I think we I can, all yeah we all, we all know, know that. that people would we look at me like, like, what are yeah. you doing? Yeah, and the funny thing is now they know. That's the real strange well, thing. Well, depending on where you go. I mean, they, they, they kind of know <laughs> yeah. that, okay, this is at least, they yeah. know this is blues. Right, right. You know, but back then they didn't know that. They, oh, they, they wanted you to be what they wanted you to be. You right. Know, you, right. And it was, it was hard for me, so I had no problem going on the road. I always, matter of fact, you know, when I had a booking agent, we were, when I was just starting, yeah. you know, we, uh, we did a lot of traveling. Every well, that's, weekend. you know, that's sort of the musician's lament is, you know, you're always the least popular in your own hometown. Right. That's kind Chuck of... Chuck Berry says you can't draw flies in your own hometown. Right. And Maybe that's kind of, home. that's really the truth. Yeah. 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 I mean, I can relate to that. Yeah. That's always how I right. felt. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I mean, the other thing I know for myself, what made me start traveling was the fact that I knew I was going to burn it out if I'd stayed in town. Right, right. And so that was what got me on the road in 84 is I just went, you know, I got to travel. So I'm going to sell records yeah. and I'm going to, you know, make a name for myself. I got to travel. And you did it. Yeah, you did a lot it. of work. You did too. A lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, that you have much more of a name than you realize in Wisconsin. You do. Yeah. No, you yeah. do. 
I think it's it's most important for me to you know to um, to keep working and to keep everybody happy. Right. Those are the two most important right. things. Right. Keep them happy. You well, know, I can and, understand uh, people that. that I work with and the audiences. I'm not like a musician either that um, that just wants to play for myself. Although I no. love to do that, yeah. I want to play for the audience. I right. want them to be happy, right. no matter what we can do. I agree. So let's take a little break here, and we will come right back with part two of Billy Flynn. This is Mark Hummel's harmonica party, and we're sitting in a Holiday Inn in Evanston, Illinois, after uh, after a gig last night at Space, and we've been on the road now for since the tenth of uh, the tenth of <laughs> April. A April. Thank you. Thank you. What year is this? And today is uh, the twenty. 6th of April, and it feels like it's been about a month, but mm -hmm. we're still here, and I only mm -hmm. have a cold. No COVID, so that's good. And uh, I'm sitting here with Billy Flynn, and Billy Flynn is somebody that I've known since the 80s, uh, the mid-80s, and uh, has played with just everybody out of Chicago. I think, barring Muddy Waters, did you ever sit in with Muddy Waters? Never, I never did. I've always kind of like you know, you played the, with everybody well, in that band. Muddy had a lot of rock stars, around right? Him. And I couldn't really get next to Muddy, but he. Well, I remember the one thing. It's funny because both Muddy and Chuck Berry had similar experiences that I couldn't get next to him because there was so many people around right. him. Hang around, but they knew that I wanted to like I wanted to talk to Muddy, and he was waiting for him. You know, I was waiting to to say hi to him because he yeah. had so many. And and uh, and I went well, you know, I'm just gonna walk away. I can't get next to him. And he saw me and he waved to me. Wow! And like it was he similar, caught, caught a vibe. Yeah, yeah. It's same with with Chuck Berry. Uh, I couldn't wild. get next to him. He walked out of his dressing room, walked right up to me, and shook my hand. Wow! Didn't, That's didn't, awesome. Yeah. That is so awesome. Yeah, it's pretty. Well, cool. you must have a real connection because I love the story about Ray Price. Oh yeah, in your hometown, and yeah. how he was singing right at so you. He was singing that to one me. night, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that that's like one of those things where you must have something that transmits, yeah, to people that you're yeah. you're into their music, and that's that's a very rare and special thing. Well, you know, it's like you can tell when somebody enjoys what you're doing, right? You know, when when it moves them emotionally, too. Right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, how did you hook up with Legendary? Was that after Lewis Myers left? Well, it Legendary was, Blues Band is Muddy Waters' old band. Basically, what it, what happened was that um, was that we had uh, recorded some tapes, and um, what they they had heard they had heard my playing on the, on the tape, and and they uh, they that's after Lewis Myers had left, right. And they uh, they they went well. We want to get that, you know. They heard wow. the song. That's that's, that's how that was the cool. beginning of it. So was that Jerry or was that all of them? I think it was Jerry and and Willie. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Willie Big Eyes Smith. The band at the time was Willie Big Eyes uh, Smith on drums, Jerry Port on harmonica, Calvin Jones on guitar, and did you say Daryl Davis was Daryl Davis on keyboard yeah. player? Yeah. So it was after Pine Top had left. Yeah. But later on, you played gigs with Pine. Top. Later on, I was Pine yeah. Top's guitar player. For okay, a while. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, and, and and the end, the the one other thing I want to talk talk to you about that you you pointed out, and I really have always known this is that Muddy Waters Band had this kind of almost aura of being kind of larger than life. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a badge of honor that all those guys played with Muddy, mm -hmm. and they carried that. All of them, mm -hmm. white and black, mm -hmm. in that band, they carried that with them, mm -hmm. and it was almost like you know, uh, I played with Muddy Waters and you didn't. Mm -hmm. That was my feeling, mm -hmm. is that there was a certain amount of that, and I caught it from guys like Cotton or mm -hmm. you know a little bit from Willie, not mm -hmm. as much. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Osher for sure, mm -hmm. Jerry for sure, yeah. uh, Margolin. You know that all of these guys kind of had that thing. Uh, I think, you know, you know it, it, it might all come down to that Muddy knew that, like, what he was important, you know, and and, yeah. and, and kind of demanded that, right. that, that type of respect, you know. Right. I think everybody kind of picked up on that. Picked up on that, yeah. 
you know. Yeah, it's interesting because all the all the people in that band basically came up the same way you did. You know, they they kind of did the stepping stones right. up to Muddy. You know, they sure. played with Johnny Young or they right. played with you know Jimmy Rogers, Jimmy Rogers yeah, right. or people like that. Sure. And, sure. and then then eventually they got that call. But right. you know, so much of that was a thing of right place, right time, right. and you know, kind of being in the in the mix. You know, mm -hmm. getting introduced and, and that kind of thing. Right now, how about now? Here's another guy that to me is real that I think is just amazing that you played with is Otis Rush because mm -hmm. he was he's one of my all time favorites and. Uh, and somebody that I know you could play like, mm -hmm. you know, for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I, I love the story about your daughter answering the phone. <laughs> He's on the phone. <laughs> well, I was downstairs practicing right. my guitar. Yeah. And my daughter was very excited. She yelled down, yelled down to the basement. She said, Dad, Otis Rush is on the phone. He wants you to play guitar for him. <laughs> and that was a, that was... That was pretty. That's pretty intense. Pretty incredible moment. It's yeah. pretty incredible. How long were you with him? I was with him for about six months. Okay. He yeah. um he had a, a lot of this was toward the end. He had, he had some problems going on at that time yeah. and uh, but uh, again too I think Otis really had a lot of um, self respect for him. You know for himself he had a lot right. of lot of uh, he knew what dignity. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. He knew what he had. Yeah. 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 And you said he never asked you to play anything. Never, he never told me anything. Yeah. He never said, had to say a word to me because yeah. he knew that I knew his music right. and his repertoire because yeah. I had seen him, you know, play so many times. Sure. Did you see him play in Green Bay? I saw him play in Madison. Madison. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's another giant. And then, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of somebody else. Uh, and then you played with Kim Wilson off and mm -hmm. on for quite some yeah, time. Yeah, Kim. And yeah, with he's... that band, with a, with a really great band, with Larry Taylor and Richard Innes. And... Legendary band, in a way, too, you know. With, right, uh, Barrel very House. much of a legendary band. Yeah. Barrel House Chuck. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, great and, band. And, and you and Barrel House were on My Heart of Chicago. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that was before. Wasn't that was it? before, yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, Kim Kim really did a lot for me. He, um, he made... Um, you know, by having me on his records, a lot of, more people were aware of me. And right. He put me on a lot of shows and things, right. just like you did. You right, know? right. You but, know? I mean, you worked a lot longer with him. I mean, you know, I've kind of, I mean, you know, part of the thing is, you know, uh, I've had my West Coast bands, and mm -hmm. it's been, you're one of the few guys that I've kind of had that's kind of mm -hmm. crossed into the West Coast thing for me. Right, right. You know, where I'd come out here and just work with you and right. maybe RW. and. Right. And whatever drummer we picked mm -hmm. up, Kenny or whoever, right. but but yeah, um, you know, you're one of the real rarities for me in terms of you know working when I come out here mm -hmm. and that right. we would work together and, and and I I really enjoy it. I mean, you've been you and Mary have been great people to to get to know over the years and and, and we go way back. So. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. yeah, yeah. And you know, that's kind of like what I what I want to be. I want to be. You know the guy that people want to hire. You know, right. and uh, I want him to hire me back. You know, right? I, I, right. I, you know, for me, music has been my profession. Right. You know, and I, I, that's what I do. Your whole life. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to think, you know, yeah. that we do this since we're teenagers, yeah. and we kind of just set our yeah. sights yeah. on, you know, I'm going to do this music. Right. And and a to actually make that happen is an amazing thing. It's true. And not have to go out there and get a day job. And, it's a miracle. And all that stuff. Yes, yeah. it is. It is a miracle. It's a miracle. Yeah. And a blessing. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, what would you what would you say in terms of the current scene versus the uh, scene back in the 70s? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I kind of have the same thing on the West Coast where I got into this in the 70s on the West Coast. And I've seen all these changes in just the way the scene has has happened. I mean, part of it for me, and I'm sure you feel the same way, is all the old guys that have, have you know, passed on to the other side and how how that's affected it uh, because there's like a missing link now. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, it's like, as Charlie Musselwhite says, the land's moving up. Mm -hmm. You know, Land's that it's kind shorter, of, right? yeah, you know, yeah. we're kind of becoming yeah. the influence on the younger guys. Yeah. And, uh, 
and I'm just curious what your what's your viewpoint is on just you know the way blues is the blues world has changed and how you know the older guys not being around has really changed things and stuff like that. I mean, really, the sad part of it is it's becoming irre irrelevant. Right. Is what is what's happening. What right. we're what we're doing. Maybe this thing right here might be irrelevant, you know, with the uh, technology. But I guess what they say now, they sold more guitars the last couple of years than they have, and uh, maybe in history. Wow! So there is there is, there is a, something going yeah. on there, you know. Right. But I think the music itself, it's kind of like the difference between, say, like when we were first starting the the like the Robert Johnson and the big Bill Brunsey was the old blues and Muddy Waters and Holly Wolf blues. was the new blues right. and B.B. King. Now those guys are gone and the sound is different. You know, that sound that, 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 that we heard was different. And um, I, don't, I have no problem with blues changing. You know, I think, but there's a certain amount that this the structure of twelve bar. That's what I like. I love twelve mm -hmm. bar. I'm a twelve yeah. bar person, and right. I, I mean, I like ballads. I like you know everything, but really that um, that form seems to be changing. Yeah, because a lot of people that are um, like the for, shuffles are becoming rare. Shuffles. That's the shuffles word. are becoming rare and uh, shuffles and yeah yeah and and the twelve yeah. bar form. Right. A lot of things that we like about the blues. And um, are 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 changing, you know. And um, yeah. the people that that are playing it now listen to um, the things that we didn't necessarily listen to, like um, like like rock music, like rock and yeah. pop music. And, they, yeah. and there's a big influence in that. And I guess at the at the time, in a way, the 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 music that we kind of grew up with was changing too. So. Well, I find it interesting that, you know, people talk about the blues has to move on, but if you're copying Jimi Hendrix, you're only moving it up by about, what, five, ten years? I agree with that. <laughs> I was, what, you know, you're, not really, you're not really in the 21st century if you're still into Jimi Hendrix. You well, know? I thought, you know, like yeah. when, when people say, oh, you should be doing something different with blues, right. well, it's like, a, it's like a big, you know, like you have, the, you know, like you're in a kitchen, you have all the ingredients. Right. It's the same with you know, like with blues. You know, you 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 take a little of this, you take a little of that, and and put it all together. And yeah, and you, well, that's you, what I'm saying about yeah. the way you've mixed all these styles together. Is you've you know you've taken everything you've learned and you throw it into a pot and you mix it up, and that's kind of what a style is. Yeah, a style is yeah. that thing of having all those ingredients, yeah. like you say, together yeah. to make a style. I tend to kind of, I got to admit, I mean, when I play somebody's song, I tend to kind of go, I'm going to stay within the confines of this style. Yeah. And and so I'm not quite as free as, say, you know, I hear you play. I mean, I hear you, when you play, you really, you really have gotten to that place where you mix, you know, you can throw a B.B. King lick and an Otis Rush lick and mm -hmm. a you know, Jimmy Johnson like or whatever, you know, and it's like when I play, I still tend to kind of go, you know, if I'm playing a Sonny Boy song, I'm going to stay in Sonny yeah. Boy's bag. Right, right. Even though I'm improvising, right. I'm still staying within that right. bag. Right, right. And, and I think that's more of, maybe it's more of a harmonica thing. I don't know. I, I just always didn't want to feel limited. Right. You know, and like, you know, like coming up with something new, seems to be like the, the concept now in, in the time we're living is that there's more distortion when they say, right. oh, you got to do something now. Maybe it means electronically versus say, um, I'm going to take a Charles Brown song, but I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to put, um, a funky beat to it. Right. And I might, I might throw a little bit of uh, Luther Allison licks on top of it. Right. You know, those are, that's, that to me is coming up with something different. Right. I agree. It's I not agree. necessarily the electronics <clears throat> or the speeding it up. Right. And that's Any, really the tradition of blues. Is, yeah. Is to take something from another era, maybe 20 years earlier, and update it a bit. That's exactly, yeah. I, th I think you're right. The word tradition right there is the tradition is to take something older and, and make, make it, it your own. own. And make it your make own. Make it your own. Right, That's right. It. 
So, but, you know, I have to say, I mean, you know, I know that a lot of those older guys, man, they really had this attitude of, you know, I like to hear it a certain way. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know what I mean? Sure. And it was kind of like they wanted to hear it the way they right. wanted to hear sure. it. They didn't want to hear it where it's like, you know, some guy. Right. You know, when they got yeah. that, it was like they seemed to turn off yeah. to it. That's, that's the know. first thing you've got to learn. Right. Don't overplay. Don't overplay. And blues is supposed to be simple music. Yeah. I love what that guy said the other night in St. Louis where we were talking to him and he says, it's like a baby's what do you say? It's like a baby's nipple. It's yeah. like, you gotta keep it you gotta keep it real. You gotta right. keep it simple. Yeah, down if to it, earth. Down yeah, you gotta earth, keep yeah. it down to earth. If it gets too complex, mm -hmm. you lose the whole but the weird thing is in this modern world, we're in such a hyped up amp amped up world mm -hmm. that in a lot of ways I think sometimes maybe that's why people relate to that yeah I don't know you know I'm just I think curious. too is that you know like part of the part of the thing that you know we learn from our elders in music is such as you I know you have played with Johnny Waters oh, yeah. and you know like Charles Brown and, and, and the real legends of the blues and uh, they, one thing that I've learned from them was how to present the music. Right. Always present it in a positive way. Right. And uh, I'll make, you know, when people ask you to play a song, they might not even really want to hear that song. They want to right. feel special that they can talk right. to. Right. That's a good point. So, you know, if, That's you, a good if point. you, you know, like I always say, serve it with a smile. Right. And, you know, it doesn't work every time, but it, tr you, <laughs> it didn't you, work in, in Springfield. <laughs> the lady said, sweet on Chicago. And I said, that was a hundred dollar request. <laughs> Tell her we're for 50, work. make it look worth yeah. the deal. <laughs> yeah, serve it with a smile, you know, right. and uh, it doesn't work every time, but, um, right. you know, yeah. you try. <laughs> well, um, I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to uh, just bounce off of you here. Uh, well, the big th the, the the big news is that you won a Grammy. What year was that that you won the Grammy? I think for? it was 2010. 2010, you won the Grammy for the movie Cadillac Records mm -hmm. uh, with Beyonce, mm -hmm. where you guys did at last, mm -hmm. and she won the Grammy. And mm -hmm. because you were on the record. You won it as well. You won it, right. And so that's a very unusual thing in blues. Yeah. I mean, I, Muscle White was nominated something like 19 times mm -hmm. before he finally won it. Sure. You know. And, you know, realistically, it's not my, maybe my Grammy. I, I, I'm matter. a Grammy. Doesn't matter. You know, be, because I was on it, and right. uh, I'm a Grammy award-winning musician. Right. And um, that was a shock. Yeah. It was a shock to me. I didn't, yeah, must have you know, awesome. because I think everybody thought that the the movie itself was going to win it. Right. The soundtrack and, you were and, on. and yeah. missed on. Yeah. And then a few days later, I heard somebody say that, oh, you're a winner because, you know, you, you were on that <laughs> single. But the truth is yeah. that when I, um, when, when I was doing the movie, they sent me some CDs to work on of all the Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters. And on the same CDs, there was uh, Eddie James. Now... I, at that point, I could have easily said, um, oh, they probably don't want me to play the Edda James. I'm just going to do the Chuck Berry, my specialty, Chuck right, Berry and Muddy right, Waters, right. Hollow Wolf. Right. But um, there were these other songs that I think were like five songs. And uh, after I worked on the other stuff, I said, okay, now, you know what? I'm going to get ready for this. I mean, you know, I didn't know if I was going to be part of that or but not. But you got I, I thought there would be, yeah. So I, I I sat for two weeks with those songs, all all the songs, and um, I worked on them, and um, and in in got to and they were real hard, very very hard music to I play. Bet. At a James yeah. was, uh, at last, and um, uh, all I can do is cry. You know right. some of her iconic hits that uh, that that she had in. Uh, I worked on them, and I thought, well, if they're if they're going if they want me to be on, I'm gonna be ready for them. Even when I got to the uh, after the session, I would I would go back to the room, and that's what I do. I'd take out my my recorder and play the uh, play the tapes and play along with them, and and look at the charts. I wrote charts out for it. And uh, did Larry help you with that, Larry Taylor? In the studio, Larry was a help to me. But but the the work before it, you did. You know, I I did that. Yeah. I. You know, I, I, I knew the changes, you know, I could hear them, 
and I wrote them out. And uh, so when we were we were done with, um, the, I think the second day or third day of recording, he said, "Okay, tomorrow's going to be out of James." And I went, "Okay, I'm ready." For it, you know? <laughs> and when I think back, I on you it, were glad on glad well, that's, about that. That's yeah. exactly you could have blown that. It was there was yeah. a message there. It yeah. was like. You gotta Be work prepared, hard. Yeah. Like you said, you don't want to have a you don't want to have a day job. Well, this is a day job. Yeah, this is your job. Is. This is our day job. Absolutely. I don't even think of it any other way because right. uh, even though we were shut down for a couple of years from the pandemic and. Now we're really uh, struggling to be out here too. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I think it was a it was a it was a message to me. It was like, man, you got to work what you do. You have to work really hard. And, How does and, it feel being out on the road after two years at home? It feels great. I mean, in in a way, it you know, like I mean, the the, the feedback from the audience is uh, is something that you know that that you probably will never forget. You know right. what it was like not to have right any human reaction to your music yeah. and to get out of the basement to right. get out of the bedrooms and right get away get, from the zoom screens yeah or, the zoom screens yeah, and the, the youtube feeds or yeah, whatever yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah you know it's not the same now you know that's that's a great thing i just yeah. i just hope that we can remain healthy out here you know and um, i know i mean i i'm finding you know being out is um it's definitely a grind, but I have to say, as usual, you know, the music is what makes it so special. Makes it happen, right? You know, no doubt about definitely, it. Definitely, yeah. definitely. The thrill is a huge. It thrill. is a thrill. It's a thrill. Absolutely. Having having you and Rusty together for me is just really, you know, Thank it's you. a dream team. Well, it's great Thank with you. you two guys. Yeah, it's a just because both of you really understand this yeah. music, and you both know how to, you know, do that thing. Rusty's unique. He is very unique. He's a talent. I he mean, is. He's absolutely. such a such a incredible musician. Yes, he is. And incredible he's really person. got a gift. Yeah. Both of you guys really have that gift to be, um, you know, the, the the wide breadth of what blues is, yeah. especially you know Chicago, mm -hmm. Chicago blues, mm -hmm. you know, heart blues, heart blues, right, guitar blues, yeah. West Coast blues, you know. The well, whole that's the game. thing. That's the thing about music is that. You know, if you're a, if you're even if you're a drummer, when you play with a harp, you're going to play different than you do if you're playing with a piano player, yeah, or a guitar player. Right. So there's so many things to learn in music. I mean, yeah. just you know, it's, and it's, it's amazing how in the modern blues world that that part of it is so rare now. Yeah, it used to be. It seemed like when we first got into this music in the '70s, there was a much smaller. Uh, portion of musicians that were doing this kind of music, but the the ones that were doing it were very dedicated to mm -hmm. it. Now it feels like it's opened up a lot more, but that there's it's kind of lost a lot of the uh, dynamics. The, well, the dynamics and just the kind of uh, uh, workmanship attitude towards blues. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that comes from. Not having that connection when blues were actually hits, right? You know, I mean, back in the day when blues were hits, that was legitimate, right? Music. Now it's just like, oh, okay, you're in E. Well, it's well kind I of can a general, do that. yeah. It's I become a that. kind of a general thing, yeah, yeah. And and you know, Generic, the the interesting yeah. thing is, I remember there was a point where like you had these blues people who would put out blues records, and it still happens. You know, these rock stars that are like in their sixties or seventies, and they go. I'm going to put out a blues record because right. this was my roots, mm -hmm. you know, and, right. and you realize like, you know, it might have been a little bit, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but not quite the way. You right. Know. Right. Yeah. You, so, you know, it's, you just can't fake it. No, you, you can't. can't fake this you music. Can't. That's it's, that's what makes it the hardest thing. Right. With, uh, you know, like you're going to play. <laughs> People, you, know, you could teach somebody how to do that. Sure. But when it comes to blues, like, how do you do that? Yeah. Where do you put your fingers? How far do you put your fingers right. this way? Right. You know, there's no... It's all very... You can't really yeah. teach it. Yeah, you can't you teach. You kind of can't really teach You really it. can't teach You it. can show someone where the notes are. Right. But you really can't inject the yeah, feeling. It's, into it. There's it's, no way to buy the feeling. It's different. Yeah. It's different in yeah. that way. You have to learn the feeling yeah. and you have to experience the feeling to really get it. Yeah. 
And, and that's where I feel like the pass down thing is so important. Yeah. In our generation, right. it was really what it was about. Right. And people that want to learn it, they'll they'll learn it from yeah. from musicians, you know. Sure they and, will. Uh, and from records, to it, a from records, extent. yeah, yeah. If they really want it to do it, then they and they understand that it's not going to be easy. And you have to immerse yourself. In right. It. That's the big thing to right. me. That's the the number one thing is immersing yourself in the music. Right. You know, and yeah. I know everybody in this band listens to, you know, the blues all day long. Sure. You know, that's yeah. kind of the way it is. So. Yeah. And you know the other influences too. You know, like, um, like, like when disco was popular, they they um, came out with disco and blues. I I like that too. Yeah. To be honest, I like I love funk music, mm -hmm. and uh, I I like that. Uh, you know, the the more modern blues like, um, you know, and from stuff like that. from like say the thrill is gone, right, all the way to um, you know to. Uh, uh, down home blues, easy. Bobby you know, Rush, yeah. Bobby Rush, yeah, yeah. And Tyrone Davis, you know, right. uh, I love this kind of soul music. blues. Yeah, soul yeah. blues, right? Yeah, you put out some soul blues records. I did. I yeah. have record on it. Yeah, right. Well, cool, Billy. It's been great. Mark, thank you for All right, man. thank you for having us on the road. You're the one. Well, You're the guy you, that man. gets us out here. Thank you. Yeah, it's my job. <laughs> yeah, it's my job. And in you life. do it well. Well, thank you so much.